we can start. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Wednesday night at the lab. My name is Elizabeth. I work here at the Biotech Center and I will be filling in for Tom for the next two weeks. On behalf of the Biotech Center, UW-Madison Division of Extension, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, I would like to thank you for coming to Wednesday night at the lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce Joe Mason. Joe is a professor and former chair of the Department of Geography at UW-Madison. Tonight, Joe will speak on dunes, dust, drought, and downpours, evolution of Great Plains landscapes and changing past and future climates. Welcome, Joe. You just wanna make sure you're uh, in the camera frame over here. Oh, okay. perfect. Sure. So we have a few questions we like to ask. The first one is, where were you born? Chicago, Illinois. Nice. Uh, where did you go to high school? Woodstock, Illinois. Woodstock. Um, where did you go for your undergrad? UW-Madison, and then um, after wasting a bunch of time, UW-Stevens Point. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you study? Uh, oh, I, too many to list from UW-Madison, too many majors. Um, I was a soil science major at Stevens Point. Nice, nice. And then where did you go for your advanced degrees? Um, not far away, University of Minnesota for a master's degree, and my PhD was here in geography. Awesome. Well, further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in welcoming Joe Mason. Okay, um, can you hear me all right? All right, um, thanks for coming out. And uh, I should start by saying, um, technically I'm a geomorphologist, so I study um, landforms, uh, like these landforms of Western Nebraska and the processes that create them. But um, I also study lots of things related to soils and past climate. So, um, I'm not able to advance. That's great. There we go. This slide was just to remind me to admit that I didn't do all this work myself. There are many, many students and um, colleagues that uh, collaborated with me on this work, and I'm very grateful to them also. Uh, the people who own the land where our study sites are located, who I'm longtime friends with. Everything I'll talk about today, and I want to hide the, um, the video panel, maybe. No, is that? That's not what I want to hide. Hide the floating. Okay, so you can see the top of my. No, you can't. Well, all right. Um, okay. So uh, everything I'll talk about today was funded by the National Science Foundation um, generously. And uh, almost every other talk I give, I can use this location slide to, to talk about where my study area is because I've done so much research over the last um, three decades, really, out in this part of the world, um, including the yellow areas, which are, are dune fields, um, like the Nebraska sand hills that you might have, oh, sorry, that you might have heard about. Um, and uh, this stuff downwind of the sand hills, southeast of the sand hills called Luss, or Luss if you wanna be closer to the original German term. So you probably have a good idea what um, sand dune fields are like. Just be aware that in the central Great Plains, uh, the dunes are almost all completely stabilized today by native grassland, um, creating uh, what I think is really one of the most beautiful and, and distinctive landscapes in North America, um, in the heart of the Nebraska sand hills. But we know now from research that I've been involved in that these have been bare active dunes migrating in the wind many times in the past, including as recently as seven or 800 years ago. So that's a little part of the story that I'll talk about tonight right near the beginning. Now, what about that, that idea of lust? This is a nice dramatic um, satellite animation. It's from April, 2022, which you can't see, 
Uh, and your eye is probably caught first by the smoke from these fires in New Mexico in the mountains that were very dry at that time. But also note this wall of dust going south across the Great Plains, which were also um, in the second year of a multi-year drought. Uh, and the, the, the dust here is being picked up by north winds behind a cold front that's passing through, which is probably the same scenario that created the lust deposits of the Great Plains over um, actually millions of years into the past. This is not, not a new phenomenon in the, in the Great Plains, although um, dust has occurred in greater or lesser amounts. Dust storms have occurred more often or less often as you go back through time and even in historical times. Um, and that dust that's picked up blows downwind and becomes this really blah looking material. Uh, these people are excited about it, but they're lust researchers. They're at a conference called a, a lust fest, which was held um, this year, uh, the year of this photo in Poland, where there is a lot of lust. There's lots of lust in East Central and Eastern Europe and on from there east to China. Um, vast quantities of dust that's accumulated. But there's also vast quantities of dust. Oh, what happened here? There's also vast quantities of dust um, that have accumulated on the, the central Great Plains. There are places in Nebraska where you can walk up and stand at the foot of a, of a great wall of dust, basically, that accumulated over, in, in both of these photos, 600,000 years. We know because there's a volcanic ash down here from Yellowstone that uh, relates to an eruption at that time, 620 or so thousand, no, yeah, roughly 640,000 years ago. Um, the other thing that you might note here is although lots of this looks pretty bland and tan colored, um, like the dust itself, you can see these bands kind of weakly expressed here, but very strongly expressed in reddish brown over here, which are buried soils. So these are soils that formed at times when there was less dust, basically, when there were fewer dust storms, less dust accumulating, more time for soil development to occur. The other thing that you can see in this photo is a paleo gully. This is a gully eroded in less deposits and then filled with more dust, um, which is a little bit unusual. But we, there are other sites where you can see this. Um, I've done a lot of research on different aspects of the loss in the Central Great Plains, most of which I won't have time to talk about tonight. Um, I'll just mention one thing that I have contributed to, one, one line of research I've contributed to and is, is sort of relevant um, for this talk. You might have learned uh, in places like Wisconsin or Illinois that loss is basically ground up rock that was that came out of the glaciers and then got picked up by the wind, but that's not the story really at all for the Great Plains Lus, which is most of the Lus in North America. It is dust eroded from rocks out here on the Western Great Plains, the ones that are, the areas that are shaded here, rocks that are uh, 20 to 30 some million years old, uh, some of which are actually ancient Lus deposits. And so that rock has been eroded by wind and water. The dust from that has come east, landed in the dunes like the Nebraska Sandhills, and it stayed there for a while if the dunes were grass covered at that time. But whenever the dunes were active, that dust was picked up again and blown downwind to where it finally accumulated here um, in this band across the state of Nebraska and into Kansas and Colorado. Um, and by thick, I mean, 150 feet thick in some cases, some potentially more than that, up to 200 feet thick at some sites. Um, I've also looked at, I've, I've done research on the, the variation of thickness and particle size of the LUS and uh, the different layers and buried soils within it. But what I'm gonna focus on uh, first here is a very brief overview of some work on the youngest lust deposits and what they tell us about basically wet and dry climate change. Um, if, you, if you've lived in the Great Plains, in the central Great Plains, um, especially out in rural areas, 
you know that even today, um, there's kind of a regular, not regular, but kind of a, a sequence of wet and dry years, um, some very wet years and some extreme droughts. And what you're seeing here is an animation over 35 years from 1986 of vegetation greenness in midsummer in an area of southwestern Nebraska and Colorado. Um, the, the dark green circles are irrigated fields that stay green all the time because they're irrigating with water from the High Plains Aquifer or Ogallala Aquifer. But the native grasslands all around those fields are going from bright green to very tan or red, which means dormant, dry, dry um, almost crackling grass in midsummer, like you see here. Also very fire pro. So, um, even today, you have this alternation of wet years and drought, um, and with the drought sometimes comes dust. But we know now from looking at the youngest lust deposits that uh, there is a uh, that, that there's there are times in the very recent geologic past when there were much more uh, when droughts were much more frequent or more severe or more long lasting than what we. Uh, what we see today or what we've seen in the 20th century and 21st century. Um, a key point with this, and maybe I can reveal what's hidden behind that. Um, a key piece of this story is optically stimulated luminescence dating or OSL for short. This is a dating method developed um, that, that emerged really in the 1990s that to make a long story short, lets us determine the time since sand or lust was exposed to light, meaning light exposure as it was deposited. So we know when these materials were last carried by the wind and deposited. And for example, in this tube is, a, is an OSL sample collected from a depth of 14 meters or roughly 75 feet below ground in a big sand dune in the Nebraska sand hills. Later on through lab analysis, through, through this dating method, it was determined this is about 15,000 years old. So that's when this sand was deposited by the wind. And we've applied this OSL dating to um, lust deposits that formed during the last 14,000 years at numerous sites across Western Nebraska, parts of Kansas and Colorado. Um, and these lust deposits have multiple buried soils within them. And so um, based on, on lots of evidence, not just, um, I, I'm not just claiming this is true. Uh, the times, the soils represent times of slower dust accumulation. That's what it says here, but it's hidden. Um, the soils represent times of, of wetter climate or fewer droughts when there was less dust accumulating, the lighter colored material in between is, is rapid deposition of dust during times when there were more frequent droughts or it was drier overall. So we know that, especially over the last 10,000 years, the climate has alternated between wet and dry um, multiple times in this region. I'll say a little more toward the end about how the, the most recent dry period represented by the top of these these diagrams uh, compares to what's projected for the 21st century in the Great Plains. Um, but, but this record took roughly 20 some years to put together um, through lots of sampling and OSL dating of lust deposits and soils. It turns out the sand dunes uh, preserve records of the same dry periods and wet periods. It's, it's a little more complicated to show in a diagram like this because sand dunes are constantly being eroded as well as deposited. Um, but our dating there confirms this story, essentially. Which makes sense because the dust has to get across the dunes to get to where it's finally accumulating. And they have to be active for that to be true. We can also learn lots of other interesting things from that, that youngest part of the LUS. For example, in this case, we analyzed um, stable carbon isotopes, um, essentially showing us when there were more C4 or warm season 
warm season grasses relative to cool season grasses and shrubs. Um, I'm sorry about this bar. I don't know how to keep it hidden. Um, and so 16 or 14,000 years ago, this is thousands of years ago, um, there weren't very many warm season grasses and they increased, but their abundance varied over the last 10,000 years in response to changing temperature and moisture. Here's a couple of nice warm season grasses of the region just for decoration. Uh, and we can relate these changes to other evidence of climate change. And then one final example here, um, just because it's interesting, this feature right here is a cicada burrow um, from an earlier life stage of cicadas um, when before they come out and sing above ground, they're they're burrowing around feeding on plant root sap. And uh, the, the buried soils from roughly 10,000 to 14,000 years ago are just full of these cicada burrows. We haven't quite figured out what that means, but it's clearly interesting anyway. And, and you don't see them after that time. Uh, so that's a that's a quick look at kind of many years of research. What I want to focus on, especially for this talk, is the, our most recent research, which is specifically on a landform that I call lust table lands. These are relatively, they're, they're like flat topped kind of plateau like features. You see an example here and here. These are different different places, although they look almost the same except for the vegetation. Here's a perspective view from, from GIS of one of these table lands. Uh, they're, they're very distinctive landforms. They're common in the Central Great Plains and many other regions of the world of thick lus. Uh, this animation kind of takes you on a quick tour of some of these table lands that we've studied a lot, there are dunes typically in front of them. Um, now we're rotating around to see that on the edges of these table lands, you have steep gullied, um, apparently rapidly eroding slopes dropping down from the top of the table land right there where the pointer is. And we're zooming in here actually on one of our study sites, but you see the, the dense network of gullies on those slopes. And the gullies are basically eating up the top of the table land, which is where most of the prime agricultural land in this region is located on the top of these table lands. So this will just continue around. That's a, that's a reservoir built for surface water irrigation long ago, but it's never functioned for that um, because all these ground wells were put in to use groundwater for irrigation in this area. And that's back to the sand hills, or back to the dunes anyway. Um, lust table lands also occur in other parts of the world. Like I said, where there's thick lust, this is in the lust plateau of Northern China, um, the same landform. Uh, it doesn't look like agriculture is mostly confined to the, the tabletops here, but it actually is. That's where all the productive agricultural land is. A lot of these terraces that you may have seen in photos of the Lust Plateau were actually created only in the Mao era in the 50s and 60s, and they're all abandoned now, or, or mostly abandoned, because the land is just not productive. And here also the steep slopes of the tablelands are eroding rapidly at least apparently, and basically eating up agricultural land and level land on top of the tables. You can see table lands in other places like Ukraine um, and then east of there through Central Asia. So it's a, it's a distinctive, important landform. Beyond the importance of the lust table lands as a location for productive agriculture, uh, it has some other... Um, significance that I want you to see. Um, this is where we get those high resolution records of recent climate change over the last 14,000 years. All those deposits are like this one here on top of lust table lands. They don't occur in other places in the landscape um, because this is where there's minimal erosion. Uh, so all these soils and lust deposits aren't eroded away. 
This is also a location of lots of storage of sediment. Um, if you think about the long-term big picture, those rocks that are the source of the loss originally eroded from the Rocky Mountain. And now that material has been carried east as dust and accumulated here. And it's sitting here for thousands of years before it moves on to its ultimate sink in the Gulf of Mexico or wherever. And then one thing that uh, that's important about the tablelands that has become increasingly important is these buried soils contain a lot of, of carbon, organic carbon, and also carbon in the form of carbonate minerals um, that if released, uh, say by erosion and oxidation of the carbon that's eroded, that goes back into the atmosphere, adding to CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is, a, the, the tablelands are a major location of carbon storage, long-term carbon storage within this landscape that could be vulnerable to coming out of storage. So those are reasons to be interested in how the tablelands evolve. And that's the focus of, or one focus of my most recent NSF funded project. So let's, um, so the basic questions, this is, this is simplifying them somewhat, but we wanna know how the tablelands have evolved over time, going back thousands of years through past climate change that I just talked about. We wanna know, um, how those tablelands have survived, this is really highly erodible material. It washes away easily in, a, in heavy rainstorms when water starts flowing over the landscape. How, does it, how do these tablelands persist with those gullies working on them? We know that some of the tablelands are more than 10,000 years old. In China, they may be hundreds of thousands of years old. Why are they still there? And what answers, what do the answers to those questions imply for what's gonna happen in the future with more drought and potentially more frequent intense precipitation. Um, one additional thing that you should know about these less stable lands that I've been kind of instrumental in pointing out is that everywhere we look at them, they've been eroded um, in a, at a really large scale by wind. So this is a tableland in Western Nebraska that has these giant troughs carved in it. Uh, this one is more than 10 miles long. Um, they're uh, about a mile wide in some cases and about 100 feet deep. Uh, some of these troughs here carved out by the wind, probably near the end of the last glacial period, although we're not, um, we're not certain of the exact timing. Here's another um, kind of sharp edge that was carved out by wind erosion and shallower troughs here, another loca location in Western Nebraska. And these features are common in Lus regions around the world. In fact, in the Chinese Lus Plateau that I'm showing a little bit of here, there are places where the tablelands are gone and you can see that the wind, that the wind has eroded the landscape into parallel ridges. These look like drumlins in Wisconsin, but they're not made by glaciers, they're made by wind erosion. So this hasn't happened in Nebraska in, in many areas, but it's happened in some parts of the world where the table ants have been completely removed by wind erosion. Um, I did some research in the past on that with Mark Sweeney from the University of South Dakota using this device, the, the portable in-situ wind erosion laboratory which is a big fan that spins at different speeds and applies stress to the ground surface that simulates the stress of wind at various speeds. And then when dust starts to get produced, like erosion is happening, the machine detects it very accurately. So we can tell what winds are, what, how strong the winds have to be to erode things like lust deposits. And contrary to lots of previous research, that argued that um, LUS, once it's deposited, is fairly cohesive and not easily eroded by the wind unless it's bombarded by sand grains, for example. We found, we demonstrated that many LUS deposits, like the ones in Nebraska, are basically just held in place by the grass growing on them or other vegetation on them. Uh, this stuff can blow away under winds that are fairly common in the Great Plains. And the Great Plains are a very, very windy place if you've ever been there. One of the windiest places on earth, really, outside of Antarctica. 
Another feature that, that is especially common in the Great Plains, as far as I know it, although it does occur in some other less regions, is not just big erosional troughs, but small basins, depressions of different sizes. Here's a big one. There's lots of little ones here. This is a perspective view of some big ones on another table land. These are produced by wind erosion, um, although I'll talk about a complication in that in a minute. They're ubiquitous on the lust table lands of the Great Plains. And I always thought they were interesting, but didn't recognize for a long time that they could play a really important role in the long-term evolution and present stability of these landforms. Um, the complication that I mentioned is that there are also bedrock table lands on the Central Plains that don't have lust on top of them. Uh, this is an example here. Here's a photo of the same thing on the ground. They're also covered with small wind eroded depressions. And so these, these examples from the LUS might not actually have been produced after the LUS was deposited. They might have been kind of propagated upward from the bedrock surface the LUS piled up on, if you can follow that. That there, there might be, like for this one, there might be a depression in bedrock underneath this, maybe 100 to 150 feet below. But either way, um, this hypothesis works. This is what we eventually you know, kind of it kind of dawned on us that these depressions are actually could actually have a major role in preservation of the of table lamps that runoff surface runoff of water on the table summits is going to be diverted into these depressions instead of flowing down the outside, the margins of the table land where all those gullies are. And that's going to reduce, that, that's going to reduce the drainage area for the gullies on the margins, slowing erosion and headward extension of the gullies. And we we've, we've followed up on that hypothesis in a number of ways. One way is, uh, automated generation of flow paths of water on less table lands and in the surrounding landscape um, using geographic information system tools. This is a case of a small table with uh, flow paths generated um, through various algorithms converging on this area here, which is actually a depression, although a gully has started to cut into it here. But this is a closed depression or was a was a closed depression and basically collected all the water from the top of the table. And these gullies around the margins have very small drainage areas, in fact, which slows their their development, their, their progress in eroding the table land. Uh, and this is true of every table we've looked at. Um, but there's a there's a complication here, too. Today, there are conservation terraces and fields and road ditches and so on that are faithfully reflected by our algorithm, like right here is actually that, that this is a close up view. This is the effect of these conservation terraces in the field here. And so we're not looking at what's been, how the water has flowed over thousands of years into the past. We're just looking at what's happened with recent human disturbance. There's also the effect of a road along a field boundary here. And here's an even more extreme case where all the flow paths we generate are related to conservation terraces or roads. Fortunately, uh, but very tediously, we're able to remove a lot of those effects and create a kind of more natural flow pattern of, for example, here, lots of, of flow paths into a closed depression right here, and definitely not going off the edge of the table into the gullies. This is just an example of how we've removed most of the topography related to roads and conservation terraces, uh, but this still needs some work. There's still some bumps we have to take out, but there are ways to get around these human impacts and then also look at how humans have changed runoff on this landscape. But all of that is to say that it's true, runoff water goes into the depressions and not down the slopes, and that could definitely favor preservation of the tablelands over long time periods. And so to follow up on that idea, I've done 
uh, mo numerical modeling of landscape evolution with something called the Land Lab Toolkit, which is really a great project funded by National Science Foundation, all open source and well documented and freely available to other researchers like me. And I also use it in teaching. This is a, a lab assignment from one of my classes right here, using this to, to simulate landscape evolution. Um, but we, I used it specifically to look at the effect of whether or not there are depressions um, on these tables and how that, uh, how that influences long-term persistence of the table lands as they erode. Um, there, there won't be a quiz on the math here at the end. Um, I just want you to know it's actually pretty simple. Most of the erosion that takes place in these simulations is water erosion based on the drainage area coming to a certain point or a certain grid cell, the, the area feeding water to a certain location, and then the slope there. So we're talking about drainage area and slope slowly eroding these landforms over thousands of years, landforms like this one. So here's a simple example animated. On the left, I started with just a, a dry, uh, just a flat surface without closed depressions. And we're looking at roughly 25,000 years of landscape evolution here. You can see that without the, and, and over here, I've added three big, depressions kind of clustered together. So I think you can see as it, let me just run it again. So the flat surface loses the flat area on top, the table and summit very quickly. The, the, the simulation with the depressions still has a tabletop long after it's gone here. So the depressions in this case do favor longer term persistence of the table land form, but notice right at the end, a gully breaks into some of the depressions and, and catastrophically erodes the top of the table. But still they persist, but the table land persists much longer with closed depressions. This is maybe a little more realistic case where I started with a bedrock table land with various kinds of depressions or not, um, and ran the same model starting from that surface. This is a perspective view starting from a bedrock surface with a shallow drainage way, which quick, quickly becomes a big valley. And I've forgotten one key point to tell you about this. What's going on with these models is not just erosion, but loss is piling up. I knew I'd missed the most important point in the talk, but I remembered it. Loss is piling up over time and also being eroded away at the same time. So what you're seeing is starting with a very low relief surface with a shallow drainage way in it and a few small depressions. The table land persists over here, but it disappears quickly where the, the shallow drainage way is instead of, of depressions. Here's a comparison of that case with another case with two big depressions at the start. And this really keeps the table land a lot around for a long time until a gully breaks into a depression and catastrophically erodes it. You could see it happening right where I have the cursor. Right there is the gully breaking in and just rapidly destroying the table land. And if you start with a hypothetical flat surface, it lasts even less time than, than this example. So definitely surfaces covered with big depressions last longest, but they can, they can suddenly go to pieces when gullies break into the depressions. Uh, so this is a really, actually a really important insight this, this real table land that I showed an example of earlier may be about to disappear because this gully has broken into the depression. This may have been, may have happened in the 20th century um, based on some air photos I've looked at. And so this could all quickly go to pieces with that, even though this has persisted for thousands of years before that. Um, we see lots of examples actually in the real table land landscape of 
places where it looks like depressions were um, were catastrophically carved out like that, I guess you could say. Um, we see radial drainage patterns where the branches of the drainage network go off in all directions. I've marked some with stars. Here's one here. Here's another case. Here's another case. Those are probably old depressions that were destroyed by gully erosion. And here's a gully just breaking into one of the remaining depressions, and it's going to destroy most of the rest of this tabletop. Okay, so the depressions created by wind erosion actually protect the table from water erosion for long periods of time, but uh, can also foster rapid destruction of the table lamp surface based on real life examples, we think, and also uh, simulation. We've also looked at other hypotheses um, that we thought could help preserve table lands for long periods of time. So one hypothesis that I really liked when I wrote up the proposal for this project was that shallow buried soils, which we call paleosols, um, on the table land summits, where, which is where we tend to find these buried soils, enhance moisture availability, um, which then would increase vegetation resilience during drought, and that, that added vegetation could reduce erosion. So we did lots of work measuring the so-called hydraulic properties, the, the properties influencing water flow and storage in all these different layers of lusts and paleosols on a couple of table land summits. My student, Taylor McDowell, did lots of, of modeling, a different kind of modeling, in this case, of, of water movement in these soils and basically disproved this hypothesis. So, um, there's a there's a lot here, but what you're seeing here is uh, actually I should go back for a minute. She did simulations with what's really there with buried soils there with that like kind of an extreme case of a buried soil, this shallow buried soil that's very well developed here, and then one with no buried soils, which is a hypothetical case. And here she's comparing moisture in different layers below the ground surface with and without those paleosols. And the buried soils do influence soil moisture. If you had time to look at this a little more closely, you could see that um, there's less volumetric water content, VWC, in the, in the case with no paleosols. But that's partly because roots, plants found that moisture easier to take up from the lust than from the paleosols. So, it, the, the, having the paleosols there doesn't actually increase plant available, available moisture, and it might actually reduce it a little bit. And what really is predominant in controlling plant available moisture is just year-to-year -year variation of rainfall. It's that variation between wet years and dry years that just overrides any other factors, like the properties of these soils. Uh, this is published now. Um, if anyone's interested in looking at it and trying to figure out what it means. I could tell you, but it's it, it's a pretty technical study. Okay, and, and we've looked at a few other hypotheses that also don't seem to work very well. It's really the depressions. Um, it's really the depressions and it's year-to-year -year variation in moisture that influences how fast or how readily um, these, these table lands can erode either through wind erosion or water erosion. Um, it, it's really kind of the bottom line. So I said past and future in the title, and there's an excellent paper by Ben Cook and others from 2015, but I think the results are still definitely valid looking at more recent um, climate studies. Uh, they compared what's projected for the later 21st century in terms of severity of droughts and frequency of droughts to the present climate and also to the last uh, period of, of, dune, of dune activity and dust deposition. This is the year 1100 to 1300 is the last major period when vegetation was reduced by droughts and allowed dunes to become active and lots of rapid dust deposition. This is kind of at the top of the 
diagrams that I showed earlier. This is the, the latest layer of dust on the, the LUTs table lands. And what they found is that what is projected for the later 21st century is more frequent severe droughts than during this time period, um, reconstructed from tree ring studies. So certainly lots of potential for more dune activity and more dust deposition. But at the same time, more frequent extreme rainfall events that's already observed for the Great Plains in the late 20th and early 21st century uh, centuries, but more increases projected for later this century. So both more dry conditions and then more occasional extreme rainfall events. And extreme rainfall events are new to the central Great Plains. This is a, a small ephemeral stream um, and the same stream, same view after a, after a big rainstorm in southwest Nebraska and some of the the effects of that rainstorm on a less table land landscape. Um, so this isn't new, but the idea is that the frequency and maybe the severity of these events will increase going into the later 21st century. And if you think about a sequence, let me just jump it. Yeah, okay. If you think about the combined effects of, of drought and more intense rainfall, there are lots of interesting and very complicated scenarios. I wanted to show this photo first before I go through just a couple of those scenarios or those combinations of, of effects of intense rain and drought. Um, this is a, a crust produced by rainfall. You can see the raindrop impact marks on this surface. Rainfall breaks up the surface um, soil into individual particles and creates a dense seal on the surface that limits infiltration of water. Um, and then that seal dries out to form a crust. This is a very common phenomenon in places with sparse vegetation cover like the Great Plains, Central Great Plains during a drought. Um, this circle right here is actually from that high swirl portable in situ wind erosion laboratory. We measured dust emission from this crusted surface and found that it actually, the, the crust actually limits wind erosion. But when we look at the bigger picture of both wind and water erosion, um, the story is more complicated. So think about a sequence of, of extended severe drought, more exposed soil as there's less and less vegetation cover because of less soil moisture formation of more soil surface seals and crusts under um, occasional intense rainfall. And then also during those occasional intense rainstorms, um, much more runoff, maybe more erosion of the, the gully sides of the tablelands, more rapid destruction of the tablelands. Maybe uh, I'll talk about the depressions in the next slide, but also some carryover effects with the depressions, but at the same time, maybe more uh, resistance to wind erosion. It's possible that before the heavy rain produced this crust, this bare soil would have eroded much more readily in the wind. Um, this is just a graph showing, we, we actually have some data uh, demonstrating that the crusted surfaces have much lower infiltration rates than other surfaces in the, the landscape of our study areas measured with um, interesting devices like this. The closed depressions on the tablelands are also interesting to think about in a time of more frequent drought and downpours. They could trap runoff. So if there's more runoff from crusted soils, it's gonna be trapped in these depressions, which would help preserve the tablelands, potentially like in our modeling, but then if enough water collects that might kind of facilitate breaching of this depression by a gully just wading downhill. And then with all that runoff, you could have even more rapid dramatic erosion as this, uh, this depression is turned into gullies like this case right here. So um, maybe temporary um, protection from runoff erosion, but eventually maybe catastrophic destruction of productive agricultural land. 
And then finally, in thinking about these complicated interactions of dust and of, of drought and more intense rainfall and dust and moving dune sand and vegetation, there's a human impact on the landscape, as I talked about earlier. Not just these roads and terraces that, that influence surface runoff, but also tillage of fields that influences soil erosion by water or wind. Irrigation, which can actually limit erosion and limit dust production um, by wind. And then cattle grazing on the steep gullied slopes. So we also have to take these human impacts, recent human impacts, into account in looking towards the future. So I think these are, are complicated issues to sort out and we're nowhere near working through these potential interactions um, in, in coming decades, uh, but it's a very interesting and important research problem. And I'm gonna keep working on it, but also uh, definitely trying to get um, younger people, students involved in doing this research as well. Here's a couple, an undergrad and a graduate student. I, worked with on this project, looked standing on a table land during a wet year. Everything's green. That's it for my talk. And I don't know how you handle questions. Do I just take them from the audience? Is that? Okay, um, you first and then yeah. Is there a way to use your research to help determine things like Is there a way to use your research to help determine things like uh, carrying capacity of the eroded land to minimize further erosion and still be able to use it categories? Um. I don't do that research myself, um, but I know one of the major tools is something that we also use, which is satellite images that are processed to um, basically detect vegetation greenness, various indices that measure vegetation greenness. And then um, other people have developed algorithms that turn that into um, productivity in a given month or week or, or summer of uh, perennial grasses, annual grasses, shrubs and trees and so on. And you can look at that. There's something called the rangeland analysis program or analysis package or something like that, where you can zoom in on any place in the, in the whole US, I think, or the Western US and look at their reconstructions of changing vegetation. Um, and then potentially if you knew, um, and this is kind of much more local and specific knowledge, if you knew how that translated into carrying capacity or productivity for livestock, you could use that, yeah. So we do use the same tools, but don't go that far in, yeah. We have one on Zoom, I'll oh, read that one. Yeah. Hi, Joe, do the simulations indicate the rate of erosion of the closed depressions once they are breached? Hundreds or thousands or thousands? Um, in the simulations, it's hundreds of years, but I wouldn't rely on that. Um, one of the things that we know about this type of model is that um, it's, not, it's not sensitive enough to abrupt changes in things like drainage area. And so it's going to take a while for the, the model to show a response. Um, I think the real rate of, of erosion in these depressions is much faster even than what you saw relative to the time scale of those simulations. To me, it's an obvious question, but a lot of people may already understand it. What's dust? I mean, what kind of element is that that floats and it gets positive? It's, it's minerals, um, just like you would find in, in sand. Um, in a sand pit or on a beach in Wisconsin, it's quartz and feldspar um, and micas and so on. Very mostly very common minerals um, that are in fine particles. Particles that are uh, in Nebraska, it, it's the lush is actually pretty coarse, but it's still 
something like um, the biggest particles might be like 150 micrometers or 150 millionths of a meter. Um, so very kind of like finer than most sand that you would, most particles that you would think of as sand. Most of the LUS is particles kind of the same size as flour is, is a good analogy. Uh, and then there's some clay and so on. One thing that's common in the LUS in Nebraska and not so much in other places is, is volcanic ash, which is actually reworked from the bedrock sources out in the West. It's from volcanic eruptions that happened um, 20 to 30 million years ago for the most part. And it's the, the ash has been, the glass has been in those rocks and then it was eroded and turned into dust again and became part of the LUS. There's another one online. Did you monitor CO2 during the research period in the study of tablelands and sand dunes? Um, no, we haven't. Um, we haven't done CO2 monitoring. Um, basically, our our perspective on carbon in these landscapes is we're 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 focused on when it's in the soil in organic matter or in carbonate minerals, and so our our evidence that it's being lost uh, back to the atmosphere is when we see a decrease in that carbon in the soil. For example, when these buried soils get near the ground surface, um, what this is another project I didn't talk about, but what we see is some of the older organic matter in those buried soils is starts to get turned over by microorganisms, releasing that carbon that's been there for 10,000 years back to the atmosphere. Some new carbon is added from plants growing in the buried soil once it gets close to the surface, but the addition is not as much as the loss. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, back there. Talk a little bit about what optically stimulated luminescence is, how it helps you with soils. I'm not familiar with this. Okay, yeah, most people aren't. <laughs> so the best analogy that I know of is it works like a radiation badge. So when you, you know, when you wear a radiation badge, you for work, you turn it in every so often to get get it measured. And what, what they're actually measuring is the same thing that's being measured in this dating method. Um, radiation damages grains of minerals or other materials um, over time. And through a process of, of stimulating those mineral grains with light from a laser, um, you, can, you can trigger those, those grains to give off light as as the damage is sort of repaired, I guess is a way to think about it. And that's that don't don't tell a luminescent stator that I put it that way. But but that's that's the um that's the basic principle. So if a sand grain blows in the wind and gets buried, it it then starts to it it loses all of its old ability to give off light because it's been hit with light from the sun and gives off all the light it has to give off. Then it's buried and it starts to get damaged again by natural radiation in the ground. Other mineral grains giving off natural radiation that damage the, the crystals again. And so when we take it out of the ground and take it in the lab, we can measure how much that damage is essentially and determine how long it's been sitting there in the ground. Yeah, I don't I don't do the lab work myself, but I help start a lab at University of Nebraska when I was there that has done most of the dating for my research. And I have students that have done a lot of this work. Yeah. I noticed in some of your um, graphics that the erosion is very marked at the edge of the table end, but then it almost looks like the stream beds are flat again. How far does the lust travel in water before it settles? Um, that's a great question, and it depends on the the weather that year and the amount of rainfall in a particular event. Um, most of the streams are ephemeral, 
Um, the ones that are perennial streams, which would move the, you know, have more potential to move the eroded loss farther downstream, are supplied mostly with groundwater from the High Plains or Ogallala Aquifer. Um, so you can often see cases where there's been erosion and lots of that eroded soil is deposited somewhere not far away downstream. Uh, eventually, it'll work its way out to the Platte River, or to the Republican River, and then to the Missouri River. But um, it's a really good question and worthy of a lot of good research, I think, on kind of the travel time of that eroded soil. Yeah. Question right here. Yeah. I was wondering about the dust bowl for you, you know, this, and are we headed back into the conditions of causing dust bowl? That, that's a great question. And most people think of the dust bowl as related to land use, poor land use, and farming areas that shouldn't have been farmed. And there's certainly a lot of truth to that. Um, but there's also the fact that it occurred during. Um, 1934 was the, uh, based on tree ring studies, was the worst drought in Central North America in the last thousand years. The worst, the most severe drought year. So that's, the dust was produced during drought years um, and the bare soil created by plowing up grasslands certainly contributed but the dryness was was really key, and it it's um it's really hard to say how much the dust that moved during the dust bowl how how that compares to the amount of dust moving in like individual years in the past because we can't reconstruct past the dust deposition at that resolution. But certainly, the Great Plains have been really dusty from long before the dust bowl. Um, I can't give an answer that'll make everyone happy on that, but but and and there's a lot of things we really don't know yet. Um, but drought was was key. Yeah. If I remember correctly, loss is pretty impermeable to moisture, right? Water sinking through. Um. Uh, it's often thought of that way, but. A lot of the lust that we're dealing with in Nebraska is is on is not really permeable like dune sand, but it's it's kind of in the mid range in terms of water flow. So to mitigate the effects of more rainfall, could one drill vertical shafts down below where the lust laying ends? Um, they'd have to be really deep shafts. Uh, because of the thickness of the loss, but also um, my thought on that is you could really be asking for trouble. Loss is a material that's that's prone to what's called piping. So when you start to have water flow through loss, like that, there are fractures in the loss already. Uh, and when water flows through those, it can carve out a, a pathway um because the lust basically falls apart in water and so it collapses like yeah thin and weak. yeah you could get you could get sinkholes there already are occasional sinkholes in the thick lust because of that and i can just see you know a project like that going really wrong is the particle distribution finest at the top and then gets quartz in the lust that's stable uh, the most recently deposited loss is often the coarsest at our sites, and I don't have a good explanation for that. Okay. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? All right, if not, thank you very much for speaking tonight, Joe. Thank you. Great.